We're now going to launch ourselves into something called the showcase. Now, what is the showcase? Well, these are going to be very short, highly timed presentations, five minutes each. The slides will move on automatically, so if the speaker falls behind, then they have a problem. So we can guarantee you five minute sharp presentations and our first victim ha, who's going to submit herself to this is Sanya, oh gosh, how do I pronounce this? Sanya, would Sanya like to come up and help me with her name? <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> and you're going to be looking at using the Croatian qualification framework for early identification of changing skill needs, training related responses to them. Now, just tell me, how do I pronounce your name? Uh, you sure you want to do that? Yes. Senkovic Pozic. Senkovic Pozic. <laughs> Something like that. Please, the floor is yours. Okay, so I've got five minutes and maybe too many slides. So you're going to dictate the dynamics of the slides, I suppose. I believe the slides do it all by themselves. Do they? Okay, so I'll try and keep track of that. Uh, well, in Croatia, we, we, I'd like to share with you our thoughts a little bit out about the general framework, how we came to be thinking of the qualification framework in Croatia. Uh, I won't go into all this, you probably know it, but why we do it? Because of an increasing speed of adjustment, which the skills are taking hold of firms, the first entry uh, of women and the less well-educated is a problem, and sometimes that is related to the skills mismatch, so there are open uh, vacancies and at the same time there are people who are unemployed. Uh, okay, this is really, really fast. <laughs> <laughs> so, let it just carry on. I, I'm sort of tempted to forget about the slides and just talk, talk about it. Uh, sorry? Please keep Can going. I do that? Okay, so uh, <laughs> oh, it's, it's totally impossible. Um, so can I ask you not to look at the slides and just listen to me? <laughs> That's the best way to do it. Um, the, the main issue that I wanted to say, which is connected to what the two that we've been discussing for the last two days, is the link with what we, we have been doing and what ESCO is doing. Because in a way, we have had to do the ESCO work uh, over the last two years without the support of ESCO. We had to find a way to link occupations, qualifications and competences in some way as an evidence base for our creation qualification framework. So the way we did it was a very pragmatic way, uh, obviously not in the same way that was done here. But we uh, looked at the uh, classifications which we had most uh, importantly the ISCO classification. And we had groups of 20, 26 groups of experts who simply used the classification to say which occupations are relating to one of the, one of the 26 areas of uh, science and education. There are 26 of them. Um, they did that and then we also looked at the qualifications and tried to group those in relation to applied knowledge which appears in terms of occupations. The big problem we had was with the uh, competences and skills. We didn't have a mechanism of understanding uh, how those were related to occupations. So we introduced a, a new survey and I think uh, uh, the expectations of this new survey for us are very, very high. Not only are we going to use the survey on competences, which is an employer survey, um, an ongoing employer survey in the field for the CRO QF, but we also want to use it for improving the quality of matching, or linking on to the ESCO, um, also for our portal for career guidance, which has to be constantly be updated, and of course to update the, the national classification of occupations itself which is the backbone of all the analysis on the labor market. And that, as you know, is always going, is behind the times. The quality of our matching is bad partly because we use a classification of occupations which is dated and does not reflect the present supply and demand or the structure of the supply and demand uh, on the labor market. So the only thing I can say is that I'm sad that we didn't enter ESCO three or four years ago so that we could be developing together, but I'm sure that this will take place in the future. Thank you.
So when I said victim earlier on, maybe I wasn't too far away from the truth. <laughs> Our next volunteer, <laughs> Agis. Agis, you're on stage. Here we go. Victim number two in common. Sorry. Let's start. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Agis, and uh, throughout this lightning talk, I will guide you into the wonderful world of linked open data and how they are going to be used uh, within ESCO. Linked open data is a definition that is not so easy to digest. In simple words, it is a paradigm that gets the data connected without proprietary formats and accessible for all the people and with structure. So even if this still seems a little bit Greek to you, I will uh, try to define it through uh, an example. And basically, the question is what do you usually do with an internet apart from reading the news? Basically, you search. And do you find always the information? And if the answer is no, take a look at the following question, Google it, Bing it, Yahoo it, you will not get an answer on which is the architect of Parthenon. And the question is, does it really exist, or maybe there is no architect or designer for Parthenon? Well, actually there are two, Ictimus and Kallikratis, and the question is why the Wikipedia pages, which are highly ranked in Google, didn't show up. The answer is that our current web is poor on context, because, as you will see in the following slides, all the relations between the elements are defined through a simple, well-known HTTP link, which practically means that there are no semantics. And the next question that we need to answer is how can we provide context and semantics and build this nice relation? So wouldn't it be nice if Ictinus was defined like that, being architect of Parthenon, lived in the 5th century BC, and so on. These are meaningful relations that we want to have in the new web era, and the question is how we are going to achieve it. Fortunately, there is a standard which is called Resource Description Framework. Techy stuff, okay? What it is? It defines such context relations, it is a graph, and what is the real benefit? If you express your data in RTF by using this again techy stuff query language, which is called Sparkle, you can fortunately have the accurate results that even Google cannot provide. So the first conclusion is that the brick and mortar web must be replaced by another type of web which has uh, quite a rich relations. And this web is what is now called the semantic web. And please don't forget that because it is already coming to you. So, um, Wikipedia is open, talks about Ictinus and is RTF. Europeana, for those who know, it is open, it is RTF, and again, for another person, talks about Parthenon. So we can link these two data sets and we can have this very nice open data supported by RDF description, which will link us, fortunately, to what we call linked open data. So we have come up with this really wonderful world of hundreds of organizations linking their data, trillions. You can find all sorts of data, like BBC airports, Wikipedia, crime control reports, and so on. And now, the web is a giant global database. So what about ESCO? Shall we start asking Google about the skills of an architect? I don't think so, but we can start asking ESCO. Why? Because ESCO is already in RDF. This means that ESCO is structured. ESCO will be open. This means that ESCO will be accessible to all the world. And the next question is how can we link ESCO? And to what can we link ESCO? Start thinking because many discussions. Wikipedia, okay, landscape architecture, quite a lot of information, but also Rome 3, the national classification. So we can have an ecosystem of labor market linked open data. So we really can see ESCO fit into this giant global database. We have the technology, we have the data, know how to use it, so the decision is really ours. The next slide is thank you very much.
I would now like to invite Beatrice Schorbens on stage. Beatrice. So, uh, good afternoon. I am Beatrice Covens, Policy and Research Officer at Eurasia. And Eurasia is the European Association for Higher Education Institutions, and more specifically, professional higher education institutions. So, Eurasia was founded in 1990. It has more than 700 members in over 30 countries in the European higher education area and has associated members in partner countries. So our members are a national association of university colleges, individual higher education institution, professional association and stakeholders organization. So it's quite varied uh, membership. Uh, you probably wonder what exactly is professional higher education. Um, it's sometimes a blurred concept even for us, but uh, it's a type of uh, higher education very linked to the labor market. It offers curricula filling the labor market needs, prepares students for a very specified occupation. It has a strong internship or apprenticeship programs. The teachers usu usually work in the field they teach, etc. So, <clears throat> what can ESCO bring to professional higher education? As it has been said many times in those two days, it offers a common language for job seekers, education and training sector, and the employers. So it also facilitates employment in Europe, which is of course also the point of professional higher education. And using ESCO for higher education, it means being based on learning outcomes. So what is learning outcomes exactly? Well, we wait, okay. It's a statement of what a learner is expected to know, understand, or be able to do at the end of a learning process. So it's quite obvious. But it's opposed to what we usually call learning input, and this more traditional, which, which is defining the, um, what the curricula should include, uh, such as how much time should be spent on one topic, what books should you read, how many months should you spend in an internship, instead of you should be able to do this or able to talk about that. So learning outcomes, it's a big trend now in higher education, and we should wait for the slide, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, I think it's not changing anymore. So uh, I think the slides are stuck. Yes. Could we have the <laughs> slide, please? Here we go. Yes, that's it. So the added value of learning outcome for a higher education. Well, there is many, actually. The most important is being transversal and then offering transparency. Vertical transparency, because it links all the the levels of education, then horizontal transparency because it really shows what the curricula is about so you can compare the different curricula. It serves at all stage to establish the curricula, to assess and uh, to um, make the certification and it's useful for all stakeholders, like the learner can see what skills he's supposed to achieve, the teacher can really explain what he expects from the students, the institution can really explain what the curricula is about and the employer can understand it all, which is quite convenient. Um, so it's a big trend now in the European Union, we can see this in the European Qualification Framework, we now see it in ESCO. But how to implement it is the really tricky question because it's not traditional and um, it's not very well seen on the grassroots level. So we organized a workshop um, on December 13 in Prague to discuss challenge with uh, practitioners, uh, the barriers, the good practice, learn from each other, build new contact, and we will work on how to build study program on the basis of labor market needs, how to um, use learning outcomes um, how to adapt relevant methods of teaching and learning with practical elements, how to use learning outcome in student assessment, and how to use learning income outcome sorry, for quality assurance. So a very broad topic for a one-day workshop. 
We also work on employability as it's very relevant for professional higher education. Um, the study aims at describing employability, the way it is monitored in Europe, to compare it trans transnationally and seeks for a way to improve it at a European scale. So there's going to be a theoretical background on the European framework, summary of leading studies in the field, main identified factors favoring employment, and how the whole thing matches the professional higher education profile. Uh, also statistical input and uh, good practice and case study. So it, it shall lead to policy recommendation and projects in the months and years to come. And if you're interested in all or this work on learning outcomes, employability and quality assurance, you have all our contact there. You can visit our website, urashi.eu. And um, well, we welcome your question by email or by phone. Thank you. Beatrice, thank you very much. I would now like to invite uh, Jakob Savrel to come forward who's going to be looking at labor market ontologies and technologies for real-time labor market analytics and matching. Okay, um, I'm uh, very happy to be here and uh, be able to um, talk a little bit uh, um, about our work on uh, semantic matching, in other words, using natural language processing and knowledge of the labor market to match people and uh, jobs. Um, a slight uh, um, info about Texcon, we're an R&D driven natural language processing company growing pretty fast and uh, now 45 people and 13 years of experience under the belt in semantic technology and working for a lot of the big uh, commercial players like staffing companies, job boards and uh, uh, employment agencies. Um, the basic problem that we're dealing with is this, it's easy to explain, hard to solve. Uh, job seekers and employers are talking in a completely different language about what they both want from each other. And uh, this is basically the semantic gap, but it's not about taxonomies, it's about unstructured input. And our um, technologies, CV parsing, matching, searching, and collecting and aggregating uh, jobs from the web, uh, are um, aimed to, to make the, the semantic distance between people and jobs uh, smaller. I don't need to explain to you how, um, what the problem of unemployment is, but I think you will uh, share with me the thought that there's a sense of urgency and fast and good matching is more important than ever now. Um, the main challenges that we see is uh, fragmented job databases. There are not single entry points for job seekers. Recruiters find it very hard to reach and qualify potential employees. The language gaps in communication that I mentioned and barriers in the application process. So is this science fiction uh, to be able to uh, take an unstructured job ad, unstructured CVs and match them uh, to each other? We don't think so. The first step of um, uh, solving this problem lies in um, having complete, um, having complete uh, knowledge of the labor market, which we do with uh, job feeds. So we do basically do real-time collection of online job ads from unstructured sources. We have this operational in Netherlands, Germany, France and Italy. And we're giving this information a rich semantic interpretation, which we make available in this job feed portal, where you can search and analyze the labor market down to the level of the individual job on very rich metadata. Imagine what kind of labor market analytics you can do with that. It's all centered around the taxonomy of occupations that we've made ourselves. So kind of a, a similar effort to ESCO, but on a private level. Uh, and here you see an example of the taxonomy for administrative assistant. Um, this multilingual occupation taxonomy uh, is based on um, a hierarchical system with around 4,000 occupation codes, 50,000 synonyms, and it's already linked to a lot of existing concepts and, um, and resources. And the main thing, it's based on feedback from customers and millions of jobs that we process. We have all the jobs available in the system on the textual and the metadata level of individual vacancies. So that's where the connection with the job seeker comes in. Uh, you see a little match button here, there. And because we do CV parsing on the job seeker side and job parsing on the advertisement side, we're able to do with unstructured data a very rich semantic type of matching. 
There's a lot of technology behind that. Um, too little time to explain it now. Natural language processing, machine learning, uh, language models and search engine technologies. The main thing uh, is that it has to be very user friendly because job seekers and employers are not expert users. So with one click of the button, the natural language processing technology is able to take an unstructured job advertisement and construct a very rich structured query and get immediate uh, ranked results um, within a few seconds. And because all the data is automatically structured and nobody has to, imp uh, has to input it by hand, you can do meaningful comparisons, um, gap analysis, um, uh, the recruiter can orient who is the best candidate and vice versa. So uh, thank you, that's what I wanted to show you. Uh, we need ESCO like yesterday and others in our field to help roll out this kind of technology across uh, the EU. And we hope we can also contribute some of our knowledge and expertise and resources uh, to ESCO. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. Um, just a quick comment on the Twitter wall. Where can we find the PPTs presented during the conference? Shall we see again the streaming? I believe, Martin and Vito, that that will all be available on the portal, on the website. So yes, absolutely, you can do all of that. Um, Ricardo Ferreira. Good afternoon. ESCO and the European Skills Panorama. Thank you. So, as I must be very fast and very timely, I would start by my final message. The skills panorama exists. The skills panorama is a very powerful information source, a very complementary to ESCO. Please use it. Why do we have it? Because we want a more fluid and efficient labor market. And for that, actors need to take informed decisions. And to take informed decisions, any actor will necessarily need to have information. There is the need for availability of information on skills needs, on skills mismatches in the short and medium term for any actor in the job, in the employment market, in the skills market to take decisions. So that's what the skills panorama tries to do. It is a central access point for information on skills needs and mismatches from various European and national sources. This is the main message here. It is joining information from different sources and it's structuring that information according to what we feel might be the needs for the users. So the information is structured in occupations, sectors, skills and countries. We are not producing new data, we are not producing new data, but we are joining together data from different sources. And what we are bringing as an added value is that from that data, we are producing new analysis, bridging over data from national sources and European sources. Because in most cases, people use only one source of data. And we are here trying to provide a single overview of European and national sectoral findings on skills needs up to 2025. The panorama was previously this. Any of you could have access to these data sources. They were spread all over, and most people would use only one of them, the one they are used to use, the one they know better. What the panorama tries to do is get all that together and pull it, put it into a single access point. The skills panorama is just that. It's just that image, a single access point for you to obtain skill-related data. And here is a link with ESCO. ESCO allows it to be comparable. ESCO allows data being produced in different data sources, being available in different data sources to be comparable for us to help demand and supply side of the skills market. We are trying to cooperate, we are trying to provide inf important information to help the labor market, those actors that you see there, and at the same time we we need to support the, the, the demands, the supply side of skills for better understanding the skills demand and supply, for allowing people to take better informed decisions. This is a very snapshot. You see on, the, on your top left the organization by different uh, entry points, occupation, sector, country and skills, and further below you see the links for analysis. 
analysis coming from, those, uh, from, from that data. Here is a snapshot of the data being organized, in this case by country, uh, by occupation, but uh, sorted by country, allowing the comparison of two different occupations. As you see, it's data from CDFOP in that case. And the information, the analysis of the data, this is produced by the panorama, for the panorama, is trying to focus directly to the matching, to a better matching in the skills. We are trying to reach two types of complementary audiences. On the one side, policy bodies and institutions, either on the demand side or on the supply side of the skills market, either at European, national or local level. But on the long run, we will move to introduce uh, more structured information for individuals with a better use of technology, with a better use of semantics, with a better use of linked data, we can start providing information better uh, tailored to individual needs. ESCO will clearly be supportive for the skills panorama by providing the taxonomy on which to base the outcomes of the panorama, and at the same time, by showing the information sources that are existing, the panorama will be supporting ESCO by pushing ESCO to the different stakeholders. So the invitation that was done here before, please adopt ESCO, is being done also through the panorama. This is the last slide. So what we have done in the next steps for the near future, my final message is the first one. The panorama is there. It is a powerful source. Please use it. Please provide us feedback on, on it. Thank you. Ricardo, thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, last but certainly not least, Stefan Vinsveit. The floor is, would you like this microphone? Yeah. So this is a little bit like speed dating. I hope I don't miss the important points today. So I want to talk in this last ISCO showcase about global ontologies for discrimination-free application process. That may be a new dimension of what we have heard in the last two months. So, in addition to other benefits of such ontologies, we believe that the discrimination-free application process is one of the most promising. Why? Because we believe that in maybe in the next three, five, seven years, that may become law in Europe, in Canada, and in other countries. And that could be quite beneficial to everybody and to the society as a whole, but it will change the process completely as we know it today in application. One example to underline the importance, there was a study recently published saying personal policy allows discrimination to cost only German economy alone 21 billion euros. Maybe this, the, the number is a little bit high, but it shows the importance of this topic. So what does it mean? In a perfect world, the discrimination-free application process means equal job opportunities, strictly based on qualification, skills and experience. This is what we, ESCO was done for, to give a, a common language for that. In the real world, the full process can and will never be completely discrimination-free. Involving humans means subjectivity, cultural preconditions, and many more, intentional or unconscious. So, um, things like gender, age, national origin, sexual orientation, appearance, and many more influence the process unjustly and still has to be eliminated. So, how we can um, get there? The only objectivity, or, or only the objectivity and the technology of a standard ontology and a system incorporating gradual anonymity enables a non-biased process that overcomes the challenges of the first and critical phase of the qualified matching. And this matching process is proven and not new at all. To come back on that speed dating thing, we um, maybe know why the, the, um, uh, this process is so well accepted. Um, uh, you see all the dating platforms around the world, and um, it's quite convenient to set a, a set of criteria and then unveil your personality at later in the search for the perfect match. But of course, in an application process, this criteria is a little bit more complicated. So you need an ontology for an automated match matching process on an anonymous status in the first part. When this is done and you have a sufficient result of this uh, quite complicated process, um, both parties have 
the, the decision if they want to get in contact with the other party, still without revealing their personality. On the next step, we call it partial disclosure. Um, still on an uh, anonymous um, level, you can use the ontology again to make, to match further information, background information, letter of references, and all that um, with um, uh, the requirements on the other side. And then when you feel that it's really the perfect match, then you re reveal your personality and you got into the next step, maybe an interview process. And just one um, uh, hint from our experience in the last few years with this process. We believe that you should not make that job matching in the beginning too complicated. If you add too much arguments, you end up with zero results. Just with 20, 25 different arguments and skills, very often you end up with zero results. Don't make it too complicated, make it in different steps. So the outcome, together with such gradual anonymity and the data from ESCO we can use, we will finally give a system which allows to make a sophisticated and replicable new time, new real-time process. And replicable is the important um, part of it. We see that this has a positive effect um, in the markets at all, and there is a, a proven evidence that this uh, procedure will allow um, um, uh, or improve the chances of advancing to job interviews for both immigrants and non-Western origin applicants of the 50 plus. By the way, a same issue than the youth unemployment in Europe, a really big issue, and for women in general. So, the summary, established and once accepted this gradual anonymous process with the quality and the comprehensiveness of such ontologies like ESCO will be another important tester to eliminate job market frictions in the EU and globally um, in the near future. Thank you very much.